Welcome back to the Deep Dive. You know, we all think of the heart as just a pump, but today we're really going under the hood doing a deep dive into its electrical system. It's like this internal automatic clock. It really is. And what's amazing is how it manages timing without, you know, constant input from the brain for every single beat. Exactly. It's self-running. And the core of it, based on our sources, seems to be these two uh, fundamentally different electrical blueprints it uses. One slow and rhythmic, the other super fast. That's right. And our sources really break down the cellular stuff, the action potentials or APs that make the heart both the starter motor and the, well, the main engine. So our mission for this deep dive is to unpack those two electrical pulses. We need to get why the heart can start itself, why it's self-excitable, and crucially why the timing is sometimes deliberately slow and other times just incredibly fast. Yeah, the core questions are really, what's the secret sauce for that rhythm? How does it beat without needing an external command each time? And uh, how does it use these ion currents to perfectly time that delay, you know, letting the pump fill up before squeezing? Okay, let's dive right in. That self-starting spark uh, automaticity, this <laughs> ability of cells, mostly in the SA and AV nodes, to just go yeah. spontaneously. What's the key thing about these cells compared to, say, the big ventricular muscle cells? Well, the headline is, they have no true resting potential. They're never really sitting still electrically. Think of them less like cells waiting for a bell and more like a, well, a self-winding clock, always ticking upwards. Constantly anticipating the next beat. Exactly. They're always generating the slow, spontaneous electrical drift upwards, which basically guarantees they'll eventually fire. And the mechanism behind that constant upward drift. Yeah. This is the famous funny current, right? Why, uh, why funny? Hey, yeah, the funny current, or if. It's called that because it behaves, well, weirdly, it gets activated when the cell becomes more negative by hyperpolarization. Usually channels open when things get more positive, depolarization. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. so backwards. This is during phase four, that slow climb. Precisely. After the cell fires and starts getting negative again, boom, the funny current channels open up, letting a little bit of positive charge leak in mostly sodium. There's also some contribution from T-type calcium channels. It's like a slow, steady drip filling a bucket. Got it. And that slow inward leak of positive charge is what gradually pushes the cell voltage back up towards the threshold to fire again. That's the ticket. Once it hits threshold, it fires. But notice the actual firing, phase zero, uses L-type calcium channels. So it's a relatively slow upstroke compared to the muscle cells. And that slope of phase four, the steepness of that slow leak, that's basically the heart rate control knob, isn't it? Yeah, it absolutely is. It's the ultimate determinant. If that slope is steep, the cell hits threshold faster, heart rate goes up. If it's shallow, it takes longer, heart rate goes down. Simple as that. Which naturally brings us to how the body controls that knob. Hmm. You know, running from danger versus chilling on the sofa. How does the autonomic nervous system tweak that slope? Right. So the sympathetic system, think adrenaline, norepinephrine, is your accelerator. It hits beta-1 receptors on these cells. And that does what exactly? It ramps up intracellular cyclic AMP. And CMP does two things here. It makes the funny current, if, flow more easily. And it also increases the calcium channel conductance. Both make that phase four depolarization happen faster. So a steeper slope, faster heart rate. Makes sense. Exactly. And then for slowing down, you've got the parasympathetic system, mainly the vagus nerve releasing acetylcholine. That's the break. How does acetylcholine put the brakes on? It binds to M2 receptors and does kind of the opposite. It reduces the funny currents, slowing that leak. But it also, very importantly, opens up potassium channels. Uh, letting positive charge out. Right. Potassium leaves the cell, making the inside even more negative, hyperpolarizing it. So it pushes the starting point further away from the threshold and slows the climb towards it. Okay, so it makes it harder to reach the firing point from two different angles. Clever. It's a very effective dual mechanism for slowing the heart rate down. Now, we know the SA node is usually the boss, setting the pace around, what, 60 to 100 beats per minute? Typically. But the AV node could do it, too, slower maybe 40 to 60, and even the Purkinje fibers have some automaticity, like 20 to 40. That's right, they all have intrinsic rates. So why isn't it just chaos? Why don't different parts of the heart start firing off randomly? Ah, that is the elegance of overdrive suppression. That's a hierarchy. Because the SA node has the steepest phase four slope, it naturally fires the fastest. Okay. And when it fires, that electrical wave travels down and depolarizes all the slower potential pacemakers, the AV node, the Perkin J fibers, before they can reach their own threshold and fire spontaneously. So the fastest one resets everyone else. Constantly. 
keeps them suppressed, essentially. They don't get a chance to do their own thing as long as the essay note is driving the bus. It's like the lead drummer keeping everyone else in time. Exactly. But, and this is the crucial backup, if the essay note fails, maybe disease, maybe a drug, the suppression stops. And the next fastest pacemaker, usually the AV node, escapes that suppression and takes over. Giving you that slower junctional rhythm. Precisely. It's a built-in safety net. Okay. That makes sense. Now, let's shift gears from the, uh, the spark plug, the pacemaker cells, to the main engine. Hmm. The ventricular myocytes, the big muscle cells that do the pumping, these use a fast response action potential. Totally different beast. I'm completely different. These guys are built for stability and speed. They have a proper stable resting potential, way down at around minus 90 millivolts. They just mm. sit there waiting for the signal. And when the signal arrives, bang. Phase zero is incredibly fast. It's driven by a massive influx of sodium ions through voltage-gated sodium channels. This super steep upstroke is what allows the signal to spread almost instantly across the entire ventricle. Speed is key here. But the really unique thing, the thing that sets heart muscle apart electrically, happens after that initial spike, doesn't it? This long, sustained electrical activity. You're talking about phase two, the plateau phase? Yes. This is arguably the defining characteristic of the myocardial AP. Instead of snapping right back down, the cell membrane potential stays up near zero millivolts for a relatively long time, hundreds of milliseconds. Like holding the electrical switch in the on position, what's happening with the ions to keep it flat like that? It's a delicate balance. You've got L-type calcium channels letting positive calcium ions in, which keeps the inside positive. But at the same time, you have potassium channels letting positive potassium ions out, trying to bring it back down. So inward calcium balances outward potassium. For a while, yes. That balance creates the plateau. And this plateau isn't just an electrical curiosity. It has a massive physiological benefit. Let's talk about the no tetany rule. Absolutely critical. Tetany, or a sustained locked contraction, like you can get in skeletal muscle, would be instantly fatal in the heart. Because the heart has to relax to fill. Right, if it stays contracted. It can't fill with blood. No fill, no pump. Game over. That long plateau creates a correspondingly long refractory period, a time during which the cell absolutely cannot be stimulated to contract again, no matter how strong the signal. So it guarantees relaxation between beats. It forces a rhythmic contraction relaxation cycle, ensuring there's time for ventricular filling. It prevents summation of contractions. Okay, and that calcium coming in during the plateau, it's not just for the electrical balance, is it? It's also the trigger for the actual muscle contraction itself. Yes, exactly. Through a process called calcium-induced calcium release, or CICR, that relatively small amount of calcium entering from outside during phase two isn't enough to cause the big contraction directly. So what does it do? It acts like a key in a lock. It binds to receptors, ryanodyne receptors, specifically RYR2 on the heart cell's internal calcium store, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR. And then it locks. The massive flood of calcium from the SR into the cell cytoplasm. That huge internal release is what binds to the contractile proteins and causes the powerful muscle contraction. Calcium triggering more calcium, CICR. Precisely. And this is a key difference from skeletal muscle, clinically speaking. Huge difference. Skeletal muscle contraction is triggered more directly by the voltage change itself, not this initial calcium influx step. That's why drugs that block L-type calcium channels, like verapamil, have big effects on heart contractility and AV node conduction. Well, they don't make your arms weak. Exactly. Because skeletal muscle doesn't rely on that initial CICR trigger influx in the same way. It's all down to that phase 2 calcium current in the heart. Okay, so we have the self-starter, the powerful engine with its built-in safety features. Now, the timing has to be perfect. And the conduction system uses these like extreme differences in speed. We have the slowest part and the fastest part. Right. Both are absolutely essential. Let's start with the slow part, the bottleneck. The AV node, conduction speed here is deliberately sluggish. The physiological traffic jam. Why so slow? What's happening at the cell level? It's a combination of factors. The AV nodal cells themselves are small. They have fewer gap junctions connecting them, meaning the electrical signal doesn't pass easily from cell to cell. And crucially, their phase zero upstroke relies on those slow L-type calcium channels, not the fast sodium channels. So small cells, core connections, slow channels. Mm -hmm. 
adds up to slow conduction. Drastically slower. And you can see this on the ECG. It contributes significantly to the PR interval, that pause between atrial and ventricular activity. And the purpose of hitting the brakes here. Yeah. It's all about coordination. That delay, roughly 0.1 seconds or so, gives the atria enough time to fully contract and pump their blood into the ventricles before the ventricles start to contract. It ensures the ventricles are properly filled. Maximizes the stroke volume for each beat. Exactly. Atrial kick finishing just before ventricular systole begins. Perfect timing. Once the signal squeezes through that AV node bottleneck, it hits the downstream wiring, the bundle of his and the Purkinje fibers, mm -hmm. and suddenly it's pedal to the metal. Oh, yeah. The Purkinje system is the autobahn of the heart's electrical system. Conduction here is incredibly fast. Why so fast? The opposite reasons as the AV node. Pretty much. Purkinje fibers are large cells. They have tons of gap junctions, so the signal jumps easily between them. And their phase zero upstroke is driven by those super fast voltage-gated sodium channels, just like the ventricular myocytes. Giving you speeds of what, several meters per second? Up to four meters per second, yeah. Blazing fast distribution. And the reason for this speed? If the delay was for filling, the speed must be for shaft. Synchronization. You want the entire ventricle, all those millions of muscle cells, to contract at almost exactly the same time. A coordinated, powerful squeeze from the bottom up. Not like a ripple effect. Right. If the signal spread slowly, different parts would contract at different times, which would be really inefficient, like squeezing a toothpaste tube from the middle. The Purkinje system ensures near simultaneous activation for an effective ejection. And when that system is damaged, like in a bundle branch block. Then you lose that synchronization. The signal has to creep through the muscle tissue itself, which is much slower. The contraction becomes less coordinated, less efficient. And on the ECG, you see that as a widening of the QRS complex. Okay, so just to clarify for everyone listening, the SA node is the fastest pacemaker sets the rate. But the Purkinje system is the fastest conductor sets the speed of distribution within the ventricles. That's a critical distinction. Automaticity versus conduction velocity. Two different things, optimized differently in different places. Understanding all this ionic stuff isn't just academic, it's key for clinical practice. Let's talk about a really neat drug example, adenosine. We use it for certain fast heart rhythms, SVTs. The reset button, how does it work? Adenosine is fascinating, partly because it works so fast and wears off so quickly, half-life under 10 seconds. It targets A1 receptors, which are abundant in the AV node. And binding there does what? It basically mimics that strong parasympathetic vagal stimulation we talked about earlier, but intensely and briefly. It activates potassium channels, causing potassium to rush out, hyperpolarizing the cell. Making it harder to fire. Exactly. And it also decreases calcium influx through those L-type channels, so it powerfully suppresses Presses the AV node's ability to conduct signals. It essentially causes a transient, complete AV block. And that breaks the circuit in those reentrant tachycardias. Mm -hmm. Precisely. Many SVTs rely on a continuous loop of electrical activity involving the AV node. Adenosine just slams the door shut on the AV node part of that loop, interrupting the arrhythmia. And interestingly, things like caffeine and theophylline block adenosine receptors, which is why they can sometimes counteract its effect or even contribute to arrhythmias themselves. That's really cool. So thinking broadly about drugs, can we sort of categorize them based on whether they target the slow AP mechanism or the fast AP mechanism? Yeah, largely. If you want to slow down conduction specifically through the AV node, which uses that slow calcium-dependent AP, you target the L-type calcium channels. Think calcium channel blockers like verapamil or diltiazem. They hit phase zero of the slow AP. Okay. But if you just want to lower the heart rate, the pacemaker activity in the SA node, without messing too much with the ventricle's fast conduction or contractility? Then you go after the funny current, IF. The drug Ivobradine does exactly that. It selectively blocks IF channels in the SA node. This flattens the phase four slope, slows the firing rate, but doesn't significantly affect the sodium channels responsible for the fast AP in the working muscle. And the drugs that do block those fast sodium channels, like the class I antiarrhythmics. Those are primarily targeting phase zero of the fast action potential in the myocytes and Purkinje J fibers. They slow down conduction velocity in the main muscle tissue. So different targets for different goals. This whole deep dive really paints a picture of the heart as this master manager of extremes, doesn't it? You've got constant automaticity fighting for guaranteed relaxation, and you've got this essential slow crawl followed by lightning fast distribution. Absolutely. The rhythm comes from the funny current's automaticity. 
The perfect timing comes from that crucial AV nodal delay, and the efficient pump relies on the synchronized contraction delivered by the super-fast Purkinje system. So here's a final thought based on all this. We know the body relies on those backup pacemakers, the AV node, the Purkinje system, if the SA node fails. We also know stress, like an adrenaline surge, ramps up the SA node by steepening phase four. That's normal. Right. But what happens if that same adrenaline surge hits a patch of damaged heart muscle, say in the ventricle, that's become abnormally automatic and ectopic focus? What normally prevents that stressed out rogue pacemaker from suddenly firing faster than the SA node and hijacking the whole rhythm, potentially causing a dangerous arrhythmia? Is there a mechanism protecting the hierarchy itself during stress? That's a really critical question, and it touches on the edge where physiology meets pathology. Often, the degree of automaticity in those damaged ectopic sites isn't as sensitive to sympathetic stimulation as the SA or AV nodes are. But sometimes, especially with significant damage or scarring, you can get areas that are very sensitive. In those cases, a big catecholamine surge can indeed trigger that ectopic focus to fire rapidly, potentially overriding the SA node and initiating ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation. There isn't a perfect failsafe. The protection relies on the inherent properties of the damaged tissue and the baseline dominance of the SA node, but it's a vulnerability the stressed heart faces. It highlights how the system designed for safety can, under the wrong conditions, become the source of the danger itself.